Thank you, and uh, with that, hopefully I use the right terminology. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna start out with a, a little bit of uh, uh, disclosure. I was a research consultant for the uh, Obalon Therapeutics Intragastric Balloon Trial. It should not affect this talk. Uh, and I'm gonna start out by discussing the history in the past and current uh, prevalence of adjustable gastric banding. Uh, you've heard that a few times. Uh, we'll talk about some of the past history as well. I'm gonna review the complications of adjustable gastric banding and their management, and finally discuss the strategies and techniques for reoperations and conversion. So if you look at the history of adjustable gastric banding, it, it really started in 1971 with a horizontal gastroplasty by Mason and Printon. Uh, there were multiple variants of this operation. We've actually still get to see some of these in Utah, uh, and most were largely unsuccessful. It sort of makes sense when you think about the fact that when you're doing it horizontal, you're leaving the fundus in place, which can, can uh, accommodate with meals. Uh, that led to uh, the introduction of the vertical banded gastroplasty in 1980. Uh, Dr. Mason discussed uh, having a 1.5 centimeter wide polypropylene band at the outlet of the gastric pouch. Basically the way you make this is you take a circular stapler, you punch a hole through the stomach just uh, uh, off the lesser curve, about five centimeters away from the uh, gastroesophageal junction. Through that hole you take a TA stapler and you fire a stapler up to the angle of Hess. Uh, now the problems you might expect to see with this include things such as TA staple line dehiscence as well as um, stricturing at the at the gastric band. Uh, when the polypropylene band is used, they tend to, to constrict over time. So uh, you, you may see some of these things. Uh, and then open adjustable gastric banding was described in 1986, followed by the introduction of laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding in 1993. So if you look at laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding in the United States, in 2004, it accounted for about 7% of the operations in the United States, rising to a peak in 2011 of 35.4%. Uh, frequently cited benefits of the band at that time were low perioperative morbidity and mortality, comparative ease and efficacy versus gastric bypass, and the operation was reversible and adjustable and there was no malabsorption. So it sounded pretty appealing. There was a lot of direct-to-consumer marketing. And uh, for patients who weren't good candidates for a gastric bypass, it seemed to be a viable alternative. Patients who take chronic NSAIDs, steroids, maybe have a complex past surgical history, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, severe IBS, all those patients who wouldn't otherwise be good candidates for gastric bypass. <clears throat> um, and it seemed to have pretty good early and intermediate term results with a you know, number of studies citing excess body weight loss anywhere between 40 and 50%. Subsequently, though, we got some more long-term data on banding, which is probably why we heard lots of people talking about some trepidation with gastric bands earlier. High rates of reoperation, about 40 to 50 percent. So when I talk to patients, I say flip a coin, you might need another operation if you have an adjustable gastric band. Uh, things that can happen, uh, things like band slippage, band erosion, uh, esophageal dilation from an over-tightened or slipped band, port or tubing malfunction, uh, insufficient weight loss, and commonly things like GERD and dysphagia. And what I see a lot in clinic is band intolerance. So uh, when the band is tight enough for patients to lose weight, they get GERD and dysphagia. And when it's loose enough uh, that they don't have those symptoms, then they don't lose weight. Um, <clears throat> and it's very labor intensive. You know, the studies that show the best outcomes with adjustable gastric bands generally saw people on a monthly basis. So this is a slide uh, that by now you're all familiar with. Uh, and you can see that in 2011, uh, banding accounted for 35.4% of the operations done in the United States, decreasing to 3.4% by uh, 2016. So a 32% drop. Uh, interestingly, as we started seeing uh, banding decrease, we also had a, another viable alternative to gastric bypass. We had the sleeve. And, that went up by the same amount that banding decreased in 2011 and now is the most commonly performed procedure in the United States. So what about band complications? Uh, how do you manage them? What are the things you might see? Uh, and, and we see them, and I think, you know, if you're a, you know, a general surgeon out at, you know, a rural hospital, um, you may see these. Um, you don't have to be a bariatric surgeon to, to see these kinds of complications, and 
I think that's one of the most beneficial things for me being at an academic center is that I get to teach our residents about how to properly recognize and manage these things. Uh, and many of our residents do go out into more rural practices. So yeah, intragastric band erosion. Uh, this commonly presents as a port infection. So it's important to recognize that and not just say, oh, you know, their port's been contaminated and replace the port. Now this can be diagnosed on an EGD. You may see a, a band inside the stomach. You can see it on a CT. You can see an intragastric location. You may see perigastric fat stranding. And the treatment is, is uh, band removal, not port replacement. And so what about band slippage? And I talked about band intolerance, esophageal dilation. dilation. You know, the first immediate thing you need to do is band decompression, and you need to know how to do that. You need a long huber needle, a non-coring needle, so you don't damage the port. And this can relieve dysphagia and GERD and prevent gastric strangulation. So in an acute slip, this is the first thing you need to do is decompress that band, get all the fluid out of it. And that can buy you some time. That can take something that's an emergent problem and convert it to an urgent problem, um, and sometimes even an outpatient problem. Um, now, how do you diagnose a band slip? Say someone comes in, they have dysphagia and reflux, and they've got a band in. You know, things that go through your mind, is the band too tight? Is the band slipped? What are the problems with the band? Well, you know, in our clinic, the first thing we do is we get an upper GI series, and we get um, a plain x-ray. And what that should show is a band orientation going up to about a 45 degree angle to the left shoulder. And you can see that there in the first slide right here. And then you can see the upper GI series here with not much gastric pouch above the band. Now, th these are pretty profound examples of, an, of a slip. Normally, when we see slips, they aren't to this degree, but you'll see a more horizontal orientation of the band here and here, and a large amount of the stomach above the band. Sometimes you can also see through the lumen of the band. It'll look like you're looking at an inner tube or a, a ring, and you shouldn't see that either. That means that the band has slipped on either the anterior or posterior side. So, you know, say a patient has a slip or they have, they're having complications and you decide to remove a band. Whether or not you're going to do anything with the band, remove it, uh, revise it, or convert to another procedure, what do you need to know? Well, you know, first thing you need to know if you don't do is you need a, a 15 millimeter port to be able to get out the, the band. It doesn't really matter so much where you put the, the ports if you're doing standard upper GI surgery. Uh, you do need to open the inflammatory capsule over the buckle, and there's oftentimes uh, adhesions up to, the, up to the liver. I apologize, I don't have a video of this. I just did one uh, two days ago, and uh, I wasn't able to get the, the video formatted in time. Uh, but there's a lot of adhesions there, and it depends. Sometimes you can see um, pretty significant inflammation with um, uh, inflammation of the lesser omentum, uh, foreshortening of things, and sometimes it's, it's not too much, but you need to divide the capsule over the, over the band, and then uh, there's normally gastrogastric plication sutures, suturing the stomach to itself over the band, and those need to be divided. Um, and then you're going to uh, unbuckle the band or cut the buckle, cut the tubing, and remove uh, the band. I normally, during the operation, write this port. Uh, at this point, remove port on the, the drapes just so I don't forget it, because once you cut that tubing, you sometimes forget the port is there, and you never want to have to go back to the operating room to, to remove that. So that, that, that could be not a fun conversation to have. So I always make sure I don't forget. Um, <clears throat> and then um, underneath the band, there's generally a capsule. And you know, that's in the exact shape uh, of uh, almost a cast of the band. Um, and that, if that's not divided, can sometimes cause patients uh, ongoing dysphagia. Uh, I don't feel strongly about you know, removing the entire capsule versus just dividing it, but the stomach should have a, normally, rel a relatively normal looking anatomy once you've taken out the band and divide the capsule. Um, and then you want to remove the port. Uh, appendiceal retractors can be really helpful uh, doing that, particularly if the patients still have a significant amount of uh, subcutaneous fat. And as I mentioned, I think knowledge of band decompression removal is a very valuable skill for general surgeons. So um, when we talk about band removal, um, this effectively treats most symptoms immediately. Um, which is patients like, but weight regain is, is pretty common. I've seen patients before and told them this and said, you know, if we take out your band, you're likely to regain your weight. And oftentimes I say, There's, I don't want another procedure. I'm done with this. But I've seen some of them a few years later once it's become more of an ancient history for them. Um, 
problems with insurance can come up. Uh, we talked about kind of one lifetime procedure. Um, sometimes if you convert the patient in two stages rather than one stage, it uh, can require a second preauthorization, that which may even be required at the first operation, and it can be denied. Um, one thing, if you're going to remove a band, um, so you don't learn the hard way like I did, is that Medicare uh, may only reimburse for these as an inpatient procedure. So before you decide to do it as an outpatient and send the patient home, make sure that um, if you do it as an outpatient, you'll get paid for. Uh, band revision. Um, it's something when I started practice in 2010 that seemed like a good idea, uh, but when you look at secondary failure rates, they're not too dissimilar from primary failure rates, and patients will often present with the same initial uh, complaints they had when you revise the band. Uh, you may run into a scarred field, which increases the risk and difficulty of tunneling the band, and you may damage the band, requiring a new band altogether. So I primarily convert patients when they're having problems with a band. So when someone comes into my office, the first thing we want to see is there a problem with the band. So if the band's in proper orientation and it's working fine, it doesn't look like it's slipped and they don't seem to have band intolerance, so we'll try adjusting it and following them and make sure that they're uh, making appropriate lifestyle changes, eating the appropriate foods, that they're being active, and work with them for a while and we'll make sure that everything anatomically is okay and then see how they do. And if uh, you know there's a problem with the band, then we'll talk about uh, conversion if they're interested. And if it's a lifestyle thing, we'll work on that and see if we can get the band to work for them. And we, we end up being about 50-50 on that. Um, initially, when people were talking about conversions, um, you know, early on in the, the experience with the people recommended doing a two-stage operation. Take out the band one operation and do a conversion at a second operation. Um, there's been more and more uh, literature suggesting that a one-stage operation is, is safe and feasible. And there are a lot of advantages to this. It's a single procedure, a single, hospi single hospitalization, less uh, recovery time and time away from work. So it has some cost and convenience advantages. Um, also, I found that when you take out a band and then come back later, you form sometimes even more adhesions that, that you've already taken down, so it's not necessarily easier. That being said, um, clinical presentation may determine whether or not you're going to do a one versus a two-stage procedure. Someone who has a big slip and a really uh, thinned, abdom uh, thinned uh, gastric wall above the band, they might not be the first patient to be firing a stapler across the stomach. Or if there's a lot of inflammation, you may want to come back later. So there is some judgment involved there, and if you have some questions or you're not familiar with it, it's probably better to wait and start out doing two stages before you do one stages. Um, <clears throat> so considerations for uh, conversion and reoperation. Um, subsequent weight loss has been shown with all stapling procedures. Uh, the biggest thing I notice when we've converted patients is that it's a, the stapling procedures are a much more livable procedure for them. You know, um, I, patients, you know, they don't have a lot of the dysphagia and reflux that we generally see with the band. And so even if they don't, you know, lose much weight afterwards, they at least they're, they're more comfortable and they tolerate things better. Um, now, if you're deciding what procedure to convert patients to, a sleep gastrectomy uh, is probably most similar to a band if patients have had good weight loss and they have contraindications to a bypass, things I mentioned before. Um, and, you know, if they have problems with really bad reflux, they have a hiatal hernia, type 2 diabetes, or a higher BMI, you might want to consider a gastric bypass in those patients. You can also convert them to a biliopancreatic diversion duodenal switch with good results. Um, so, some, you know, considerations for conversion and reoperation. Um, I talked a little bit about some of the inflammation you can see from the adjustable gastric band. Um, you can see thickening of the fat pad. Uh, it may be hard to see the, the gastric veins on the stomach that we frequently use as landmarks. Uh, the angle of hiss ends up being scarred because the band is tunneled up to the angle of hiss. Uh, you may see thickening and inflammation of the lesser omentum, uh, which um, if you're doing a gastric bypass and making a perigastric window can make it more difficult to get behind there. And, and rather than making a window, you may have to uh, divide the lesser omentum, which is also perfectly acceptable. Um, you may encounter post-operative adhesions to the liver, gastric wall thickening. Um, and so things you have to think about that, particularly with gastric wall thickening, is what size stapler do I use? And um, you know, if there's significant inflammation there, you may need to use a higher staple height, 3.5 millimeters or larger. 
Um, and so you really have to be familiar with staple loads and, and how your staple's firing. Um, so um, that was, you know, the other day a consideration for me with the stapler I was using. I used a standard load by because it didn't look like there was a lot of inflammation, but I definitely fired it very slowly and I could feel the resistance as I was firing it. So in summary, um, long-term complications of laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding and better surgical alternatives have decreased the procedure's frequency. Knowledge of band decompression uh, and removal is a really valuable skill for, for any general surgeon, uh, obviously uh, for bariatric surgeons as well. Um, the choice of stapling procedure uh, for conversion should be guided by patient characteristics, and I, I think this obviously applies not just for revision, but for any bariatric procedure. I mean, you should look at the patient's comorbidity. I'm a big believer that one size does not fit all. Uh, and uh, conversion can be performed as a single stage procedure. And finally, uh, reoperations involve additional procedure risk and should be performed by uh, experienced surgeons, just as Dr. Hutter was saying earlier. <laughs>